I'm not supposed to play favourites up here, but I must admit our next speaker, our final speaker, has been one of my favourite Australians for more than three decades now. In fact, I'd have to be honest and say it's really a man crush. <laughs> the Honourable Michael Kirby, AC, CMG, has served the highest institution in this country, the High Court of Australia. But he is himself an institution. In a world where sports stars, mining magnates, third-rate politicians and so-called celebrities are put up as leaders, Michael Kirby stands above them all. In a 13-year stint on the High Court bench, he was often at odds with his colleagues, sometimes the sole dissenter. But in many ways, he shaped the way we now think about human rights in Australia, and in fact, the world. Many years ago, when I was a Victorian public servant, just before I was sacked by Jeff Kennett on the second day of office, I asked Michael Kirby to deliver a leadership lecture at Parliament House. And I have to say that after 20 years of leadership lectures, his was still the finest. But I'm not going to keep him from you any longer. Please welcome Michael Kirby. Thank you very much, Dennis. And it's wonderful to be in this uh, hall with so many representatives of civil society. The mark of our freedom as a people is the extent to which we engage with each other and take part in building a civil society. I've always myself been engaged with community groups uh, and uh, that's not always the case with uh, our judges because their backgrounds and their lives are often rather different from mine but uh, I regard it as a great privilege to be here. Dennis is a bit obsessed about leadership. He, he does tend to go on about it, and I think you can analyse it uh, till you're blue in the face, and it won't really um, create leaders. I think it's something that emerges from our life's chances and experiences. What I want to say is I grew up in the suburbs in Sydney. I had a fairly orthodox sort of life. I went to the local public infant school, the local public primary school, and uh, to uh, a public <laughs> high school in Sydney. And uh, during virtually all of the time I served on the High Court of Australia, I was the only one of the seven justices who had been educated entirely in public schools. And I think that did give me a slightly different approach to the problems of the world and uh, of the people who came before the court with their problems for resolution in accordance with law. You just looked at things slightly differently if you had gone to the primary school and soon after the Second World War, people turned up, little kids turned up at the school without shoes uh, and um, were truly poor. Um, some were truly rich. It was just a mixture of all branches of Australian society. Now, I've been thinking of how to approach the topic that Dennis uh, set for me and I thought, um, though with some concern about the immodesty of it, that I would take you walking through uh, six different experiences of mine and six different people that I have worked uh, and interacted with over my lifetime uh, and some lessons that I learned which may be of some help uh, and may answer the question uh, of leadership in our society and how we can make our society a better place by the leadership that we offer it. The beginning of my experience with leadership, of course, was with my wonderful parents, a loving family. My brother reminded me this week uh, 
do you realise we never once went to a restaurant with our parents when we were young? It's an interesting thought that we just ate at home. We six ate at home and we talked with each other. That's how it was back in the 40s and 50s. Very sort of simple life, but wonderful for your brain expansion. And there was something very peculiar happened in our family. Uh, my grandmother, my father's mother, married for the second time, and the man she married had fought at Gallipoli. He had won medals there and on the Somme. He'd been decorated at Buckingham Palace by King George the fifth, but he threw away his medals and he became a communist. Not only did he become a communist, but he became the national treasurer of the Australian Communist Party. <laughs> and back in the 1940s, that, to some people, was not a particularly good look. <laughs> My grandmother was a marvellous, very well-read woman and uh, she and her sisters were great friends of Jessie Street. Jessie Street was, of course, Lady Street. She was the wife uh, of Sir Kenneth Street. But she was a great feminist, and so were my father's uh, mother and sisters. They were people in a hurry to make a change. And so I grew up going to their home and I would see scattered in their home a publication called Soviet Union. And it was a publication which was coloured, but the colour looked a little bit odd. It was basically AGFA colour that the Soviet soldiers had stolen from the Germans at the end of the war and taken back to Russia. And it made everything look apricot so that the whole world of the Soviet Union appeared to be folk dancing in apricot. <laughs> but my grandmother's second husband soon was on the receiving end of the Communist Party Dissolution Act 1950. This had been promised by Mr Menzies uh, to ban the Communist Party, to stamp them out, and the, the uh, enactment was... Um, extremely perilous to him. He thought he was going to be arrested. It was challenged in the High Court of Australia by unions and also by the Communist Party and to the utter astonishment of the Communists who of course thought of the judges as the running lapdogs of the capitalist class, the majority of the High Court of Australia in one of the most glorious moments in Australian law by um, five justices to one upheld the challenge and they held you can deal with communists uh, for what they do but you can't deal with them for what they think and believe. The law doesn't allow you to reach so far as to enter the minds of the communists. Uh, that is the restriction on the power of the federal parliament. Uh, and that decision was then challenged in a referendum uh, and at the beginning of the referendum campaign the rudimentary polls that were available at that time told the Labor Party at the time, led by Dr H. V. Everett, if you challenge this you'll go down in a screaming heap. Uh, it is not uh, going to fail. Uh, the referendum will get up and you'll have mud on your face. 80% of the polls said, don't do it. But Dr. Evert, um, who had been a judge of the High Court himself before he went into Parliament during the war, took up the challenge, went to court and won the case. And so the first lesson, one of the earliest lessons in my life was to respect people for what they do and what they believe, even if you don't quite understand it and even if you disagree with it, that the mark 
of a free society is diversity and differences of opinion and that we must guard that uh, all, our, all our lives and stand up for principles as Bert Evert did even if it's risky and even if you might lose. Sometimes in life there are things you just have to do because not to do them is uh, to surrender and you shouldn't surrender. You should never give up. So they were two very early lessons I received. It was a good thing to live in this environment where there were people who I knew were greatly hated, especially by media interests, uh, and yet who I knew as human beings and as uh, wonderful, admirable, strong and principled people. And then when I went to school and to university, I began to think about my society and about uh, the changes that should happen in it. Uh, at university, I began for the first time to meet some Asian people because we had the Colombo plan at that time. And we began to get people who were coming to Australian universities who seemed to be rather defying the white Australia policy, which was the principle of our country and which both sides of politics supported. And uh, also, we began to get concerned about the Aboriginal people of Australia. I mean, originally, Australians thought Aboriginals were ignorant nomads uh, who, if they didn't simply die out, would be totally absorbed in our population and that would be that. And so in my years at university and subsequently when I became the, uh, the solicitor who did work for the student council, I went up to Moree uh, with the buses which fundamentally we were sort of imitating the Americans at the same time. They'd had buses which went down to the south, we had buses that went out west and we went to Moree and Walgett. At Walgett the students had gone hand in hand with local Aboriginals. I'm talking here about 1965. They'd gone upstairs in the cinema. Aboriginals were not allowed to go upstairs in the country cinemas in New South Wales. They were allowed to go downstairs because there was vinyl there. Upstairs there were velvet cushions and Aboriginals were not permitted to go up there. Well, the students would have none of that. They grabbed them by the hand, they went upstairs and then they were charged with trespass and so I was a young solicitor. We, uh, we went up uh, and we went to Walgett and so I went straight to the top of the bar and I got Gordon Samuels, later my colleague in the Court of Appeal and later uh, the Governor of New South Wales to go up to defend the students and the students uh, got off lightly with what was called 556A, no convictions were entered and within weeks the cinemas had dropped their rules. So the students really won uh, and they stood up for what they believed in. We also began to stand up for the end to the white Australia policy uh, and it has to be remembered it was the government of Harold Holt that began the process to end white Australia. Uh, the coalition government of Harold Holt began the process and it was finished by the government of Gough Whitlam. But it was very much alive and well when I was uh, at school. So the lesson that I learned from that experience was push the envelope, try to see things that others are not seeing and uh, try to be ahead of the game. And a person who taught me the importance of that was a student named Peter Walensky. Peter Walensky was always ahead of the game. He was Jewish, his family had come from Poland, they'd only just escaped the Holocaust. But because of that experience, I think, he was always an enemy to any form of discrimination. And he taught 
good lessons to me and to others. Then I went into the courts and that was a difficult time in my life because in the courts to which I was appointed I was generally younger than the other judges and uh, listening to Jane there and listening to the discussion of patriarchy, well, if you go into an established court with aged gents who are all gents and all judges, boy, you found patriarchy incorporated. Uh, very good people, very, very clever people, absolutely uncorrupted people, but uh, people who see the world through the prism of their experience. But there was a wonderful judge there, Robert Hope. He later did the Royal Commission for the Whitlam government, uh, for the Hawke government, into ASIO. He was a very... He'd been the president of the Council for Civil Liberties. Very good thing to have judges come from the Council for Civil Liberties. Most of the lawyers that I work with in the New South Wales Council for Lib Civil Liberties, in the language of, uh, of Mortimer, they got their trotters in the trough. They all became judges. They all became members of the establishment. But they took with them the burning idea that there were disadvantaged people in society and that it was the duty of the law to protect the vulnerable uh, and the disadvantaged. So in those years of my times in the court, I learned to respect and engage with those you have to work with. It's no good trying to change the world for the better if you're simply fighting all the time. You have to somehow try to win over. I found a very simple solution when I was appointed president of the Court of Appeal. I served every Friday morning raisin toast and coffee because the way to the collegial uh, empathy and interaction uh, of the other judges was to feed them up and engage uh, with them on the issues that were uh, before the court at the time. And to set a good example, if you're going to be a leader, uh, you just have to set a good example and you have to work harder. You have to work harder. We may not all love Maggie Thatcher, but she uh, was somebody who set an example in uh, enterprise, energy and communication. You just have to uh, try to do that. And you have to think of new ways to do old things. You have to think of the new technology that's available in order to make your effort at leadership successful. And then I went to the High Court of Australia. Now that wasn't the most happy time in my life. As Dennis has said, during those years um, uh, there were times when uh, I was all on my own. Uh, however, I soon found a solution to that and the solution was, kill them with kindness. <laughs> kill your opponents and people who are critical of you with kindness. I'm not sure Jane would entirely agree with this. <laughs> and maybe it isn't always a, a successful strategy. But I found that dealing with people in a respectful way and killing them with kindness First of all, it was the high moral ground, and secondly, it used to drive people crazy. <laughs> uh, and uh, you may remember that uh, a senator, who's in the papers again today, uh, attacked me in Parliament on a completely false and erroneous basis. Uh, but when he did, and he apologised, I accepted it. Kill them with kindness, I say. It's uh, often a strategy uh, that works. And then, uh, in more recent times, I've become involved in international activities. And if there's time in questions, we may have time to talk about this. The international activities on the HIV AIDS epidemic, trying to spread around the world, and it's not easy, the paradoxical principle 
that the most effective way to fight HIV is to reach out and engage with the groups that are most vulnerable to HIV. It's the AIDS paradox that if you simply penalise and criminalise and stigmatise and hate and isolate, then the epidemic gets worse. If you engage, if you involve, if you participate with those who are most at risk, as we did in Australia from the very beginning, uh, then you can make headway in fighting the epidemic and making sure that uh, it doesn't spread. So th thinking globally, reaching out, and not being ashamed of idealism. I'm still idealistic. After so many years in public offices, I think it's important for people who are idealistic to be unashamed about it, to speak up for the cause of the betterment of humanity, to speak up for the cause of the United Nations, to speak up for Eleanor Roosevelt's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I received in 1949, soon after it was brought into operation at the end of 1948, to be authentic about your values. And if you are a liberal, small L liberal person, there are plenty of small c conservatives around. Speak up for the things uh, that you believe in. There's a very good exemplar of this in the present High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay. Navi Pillay uh, came from South Africa. She told me that the first time she ever saw a judge's chambers was when she was appointed from the bar in South Africa to be a judge uh, of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The first time she went inside a judge's office was when it was her own office because she grew up in South Africa under the apartheid regime. She has been a fantastic High Commissioner for Human Rights. I've worked closely with her in the recent uh, work on North Korea. She is courageous, she is strong, uh, she is willing to take risks to speak up for things that will be hated by some nation states, but she is strong for principle and she's a wonderful leader. And so, by the way, is Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General. Amazingly, this man who came up through the ranks of the, uh, of the civil service of the United Nations and the civil service earlier of uh, South Korea is a man who ha is willing to pin his uh, colours to the mast and stand up for what he thinks is right. But then, lastly, it came to a matter where at first I did not show leadership. It came to a matter where I myself was involved and it came to the issue of sexuality. Now, I've always thought, more so in recent years, that in the issues of human sexuality, there's a great deal to be learned by the LGBT community from the earlier struggles of the women's movement because the enemies are often the same. The same patriarchal attitude and the same uh, unwillingness to accept that people don't necessarily fit into their stereotypes and people have to be themselves. They have to be authentic. Now, in the years when the HIV epidemic came along, uh, both my partner, Jan, and I began to get involved in the HIV epidemic in different ways. He became an Ankali. I don't know if there's an equivalent body down here in Victoria. The Ankalis are like buddies. They're available to people who are living with HIV. And in those early days, before the antiretrovirals, uh, people living with HIV had great suffering and uh, many, many died. We'll, in a few weeks, at 
in mid-July, we'll have the biggest conference uh, that we've ever had in Australia in the International AIDS Conference here in Melbourne, when 20,000 people will be here to examine where we are in the HIV epidemic. But I go back to the very beginning. I go back to 1985, when this strange new uh, epidemic was about. My partner became an Ankali, and Jonathan Mann, the wonderful first leader of the international effort against AIDS, asked me to join the first global commission on AIDS, and I became involved in that. And in a way, that was a sort of code language for my sexuality and Yarn sexuality. But even in those days, we sailed under the radar. If people telephoned our home, he would not pick up the phone. Uh, if I telephoned the home, I had to dial first, let it ring twice, stop, then second, and he would pick it up. And people have said to me, well, you weren't very courageous. You weren't showing much leadership at that time. Why didn't you stand up against this appalling situation? Well, the answer is that that was just how it was. Anybody in this audience who is my age knows that was what you were expected to do. And you could analyse it as much as you wanted to and say, this is irrational. Having to be ashamed of who you are and having to be ashamed of something you didn't choose and couldn't change is ridiculous. It has to stop at once, but it wasn't going to stop any time soon back in those days. And the plain fact of the matter is that if I had, in those days, stood up and if my partner had stood up, there's no way I would have been appointed to the positions that subsequently came to me. I was appointed to them because I was willing to play the game of denial and the game of pretense. The notion that some people, a minority, a small minority, probably about 5%, are lifetime gay was terribly offensive to some people. It was specially offensive to some religious people. And they taught that there was an inclination to evil and that you should be thoroughly, completely, absolutely ashamed of yourself and keep it thoroughly to yourself. But we went along doing things in the gay community and going to functions and Jan was cleaning the toilets and making the meals and painting the apartments of uh, people who were living with HIV. So many of our friends died in those bad days. But then round about 1997, by which time I was on the High Court, Jan, who is from the Netherlands, now I don't know how many of you know people from the Netherlands, they are very difficult people. <laughs> he said to me one night, we just finished our sausages, he said, how long do you think you're going to be in public life? I said, oh, well, I'm, you know, my father's still alive and, he'll, and he, he lived till he was 90, 95, 96. And, oh, no, I've got a long time. I've got an awful long time. Well, we've got to stand up. And I said, oh, maybe we'll wait till the end of the high court years. Maybe we'll postpone this a little. No, no, we've got to stand up. Uh, we've got to stand up for the benefit of the young people. We've got to make an example. We've got to break the, the stereotypes. We've got to shatter the ignorance. We've got to confront the demons that rattle around in the brains of these people. Oh, do you think we might leave it? No, no, no leaving it. That's it. We're going to do it. And so we used a technique 
which even I think had a certain style about it. <laughs> in Who's Who, I have an over-lengthy entry and in it I put February 11, 1969, uh, P for partner, Johan van Floten. And uh, that was ultimately uh, found out by one of Mr Murdoch's media uh, and the re responses were predictable, but it was done. And it was good. And it should be done by everyone. <laughs> and you know, I still know judges who are not open about their sexuality. I still know professors and and garbage cleaners and others who are not open about their sexuality. It's an oppression. It's an ignorant, stupid, unscientific oppression, now that we know about the facts, the scientific facts. But there are still some people out there, including in the churches, that would be happy if we just kept it that way. Well, that game is over. I have very constructive dialogue with my partner, Johan, about the churches. He says to me, I don't understand for a minute how a person as intelligent as you can take any of that stuff seriously. And I say, no, well, I'm not going to leave my religion. I'm not going to let old men in frocks take my religion away from me. And I'm very happy with my religion. But uh, he says, Religion has always been horrible to women. It's always been horrible to people of colour and it's been particularly horrible to gays. But it'll never change unless people stand up. If every gay person in our country suddenly stood up tonight, the whole shabby charade would be over. And we have made progress, but not enough. There's still progress to be made and there's progress to be made overseas and we have to be leaders in Australia and a good example to the rest of the world. We've fallen behind many other countries. Uh, we've fallen behind Argentina, we've fallen behind Uruguay, we've fallen behind Spain and Portugal um, and we have to catch up and be leaders in this matter. So they're the lessons I've learned. Respect those who stand up for what they believe. Stand up yourself to principles, even if it's risky. Push the envelope and try to see things that others are not seeing. Respect and engage with those you have to work with and try to win them round. Set a good example to them and work harder so that they will respect you. Try to think of new ways to do old things. If you can't win them over, Kill them with kindness. Think globally and don't be parochial. Never be ashamed of idealism and be authentic. And above all, to thine own self be true. To thine own self be true. Stand up for what you know is right and make a fuss and cause trouble. <laughs>